Okay, so I told you um, that I would give you my goal is to give you weekly insights with my mentor questions, and I'm kicking myself a little bit today because I don't have quite the same. I don't feel like I have quite the same level of uh, aha moments as I did last week, but still, I'll give it a go. Um, today, I met with my mentor. Just to, I literally I finished about an hour ago, and. Um, no question jumped off the page at me this time, but as I was going through and seeing the questions, I realized the opportunity that I see on page 24 is to get a good profile understanding of my mentee's personal grasp of the gospel, as well as to begin to put a face, a name to what are my, my mentee's functional idols, if you will. What is the thing that is competing? What are the things that are most likely to compete with my mentee's love and affection and devotion to God? And so uh, I asked the question that's prior to number one, you know, in these nine questions, there's the question that says, ask what the mentee learned about God and himself or herself this week. And that question was helpful just to hear what is God teaching um, my mentee. And then when we went through and just, I asked some of these questions, how self-aware is he? Uh, in what ways do you suppress the truth or live in denial? Uh, my, my guy had a hard time answering that question because he's not terribly aware of where he does suppress the truth. His answer was some areas he's confused about truth, but not where he's suppressing it. When I think about suppressing the truth, I'm thinking about I know that doing this is wrong, but I'm going to mute that conviction. I'd rather explain it away. I'm not going to listen to it. I'd rather push it down so I can do what I want to do. I, suppressing the truth, there's a level of almost awareness in suppression. I, that's my understanding. Um, it, the, Again, number three, if the antidote to unrighteousness is not self-righteousness, then what is it? That's an opportunity for your mentee to articulate in his or her own words grace-based gospel motivation. Uh, that What does it look like to be changed at a heart level by the grace of God? That God's kindness leads to repentance and that I am not... Uh, I, I am unrighteous, and my solution is not to become a good person, but to trust in the righteousness of Christ. That's an opportunity just to listen to how well does your mentee understand and, and is able to own and articulate and apply the gospel. A question that was a bit of an eye-opener um, was number five. Number, well, number five was helpful, but that wasn't the eye-opener. Number five helps me to see just functionally what does my mentee tend to trust in? It's a simple question. But it was number six. This is maybe the only aha I had. How did Paul clarify what the Athenians worshipped as the unknown God? And I, he had a hard time with that question, and I kind of thought about it for a while. What is the unknown God? What is an unknown God? And then I realized an unknown God, I might be making a stretch here, but an unknown God is a God that we think we know, but we really don't know. Well, we, we think we understand what we're worshiping, but we really don't know what we're getting in for. And so my guy is really infatuated with a relationship that has uh, escaped his grasp. He, this girl, he wants to be in a relationship with her, but they've broken up and he wants her back and I don't think it's happening. And he is idealizing that relationship and that would be, if he would be in heaven if he could have her. Um, and I think that's his unknown God, meaning God is the known God. He's made himself known. He's made himself known over thousands of years in the Word. We know what we're getting when we get God. There's no uh, small print with him, and there's no uh, bait and switch. He is good, and he's trustworthy. But this girl, I'm going to make up a name and say uh, uh, Jennifer. If, if the girl's name is Jennifer, she's, he feels he, like he knows Jennifer, but she's an God, because when he, if he were to get her, he doesn't know what he's getting. He's, it's like buying a new car and you drive off the lot and discover it doesn't have air conditioning. Um, I, I have to jumpstart it every time. We think we know what we're worshiping and what it's going to pay off, 
but it's unknown because we don't know really what it is that we're worshiping and we don't we don't know that it's not going to pay off and i thought about that with him in those terms and then what might be the dangers of a vague spirituality i took that's the second half of number six and i said what if you had an altar a shrine to jennifer and every morning you got up and lit a candle and, and worshiped this jennifer shrine he kind of laughed and said that, that, that would be absurd I, I would probably stop doing it that He's got a vague spirituality with Jennifer. He doesn't see it for what it is. But with God, he also has a vague spirituality that, sure, I love God. Sure, God loves me. Uh, he's good. Yeah, I'm forgiven. He doesn't say so what, but it's kind of old news. It's a vague spirituality. God needs to become more real to him than Jennifer. Uh, it needs to, God needs to arrest his, his affections, his love. He needs to love God more, and that needs to be real to him at a heart level. I hope that's helpful. That's all I got. All right.